Hello third and fourth graders. Are you ready to do some history? What we're doing this week is chapter 15 part 1. Chapter 15 actually has three parts. I'm going to read part 1 today, this week. The following week we'll read part 2. And the third week we will read part 3 and do the test together because that's kind of a long time to remember what happened in part 1 and part 2. So we will do it together. So don't freak out on me. It's a long ways away. Don't think you're going to forget all this stuff. We'll do it together. Right now I want you to turn in your history book to page 141 and we'll read part 1 together. Fourth graders, you might want to read it on your own. It's up to you. But third graders, I would like you to read it with me. Follow along as I read it to you. It's chapter 15, A New World in Conflict, War Against the Colonies, King Philip's War. While the kings of Europe fought and schemed to make their kingdoms larger, the English colonies in North America were growing larger all on their own. More and more men and women were making the long journey across the Atlantic Ocean. New settlements spread across Massachusetts over into the land we now call Rhode Island and Connecticut. The new settlers built more houses, cleared more fields, and chopped down more trees. They needed more space, so they kept moving farther west and farther into Native American lands until the Wampanoag, Wampanoag tribe decided to fight back. At first, the Wampanoag and the English had been friends. When the English settlers first came to Massachusetts, the Wampanoag showed them how to fish, how to trap game, and how to survive the harsh northern winters. But as the Massachusetts colony grew larger, the colonists no longer needed the Wampanoags. And I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that tribe right, but I'm doing the best I can. They grew their own crops and traded their own goods to European merchant ships in exchange for the salt, weapons, and seeds that they needed. And they forced the Wampanoags to give them more land for their growing town. The king of the Wampanoag Wampanoag tribe, uh, Medicom, saw that his kingdom was vanishing. When his people went to fish in their favorite streams, the banks were crowded with colonists. When they walked in their hunting grounds, English hunters lurked behind trees waiting for deer. I am resolved, Medicom announced to a friend, that I will not see the day when I have no kingdom. One cold January morning, a young Wampanoag man left his tiny village and hurried down the icy dirt road toward Plymouth Bay. He had grown up in Met Metacom's kingdom, but in his teens he had gone to the new college built by the English to train Christian ministers. At this little college, which the English called Harvard, the Wampanoag boy had been given the English name John Sassman. John Sassman knew Medicom well. Because John could read and write in English, Medicom had often asked him to carry messages to the English leaders. But now John Sassman carried a warning. John walked for hours, shivering in the gray winter air. His feet grew numb with cold. Finally, the tall wooden walls of the Plymouth Fortress came into view. John Sassman hurried through the gates. Where is the governor, he asked. I must speak to him right away. The governor of Plymouth, Josiah Winslow, was busy with paperwork, but John Sassman waited, anxiously glancing back at Plymouth's strong walls. When he, had finally brought, when he was finally brought into the governor's office, he spoke so quickly that Winslow could barely understand him. King Medicom is raising an army, he blurted out, He's asking every other tribe to join with him to fight against you. He plans to drive the English back to their home. I've come to warn you, but please, please don't send me back. 
He doesn't know I'm here, and if the warriors find out that I warned you, they'll kill me. Winslow sighed. Like many English, he thought that the Winn Wampanoag were stupid and not to be trusted. You can hardly believe an Indian, he remarked to a friend, even when they tell the truth. He turned to John Sassaman. Go back home, he said. Plymouth Plantation is safe. Sassman pleaded to stay, but Winslow refused. When Sassman left the fortress, his eyes were filled with tears. A week later, John Sassman disappeared. His body was found, frozen into the ice of a pond. His neck was broken. Josiah Winslow and the Plymouth Plantation leaders took alarm. Perhaps Sassman's fears had been real. When two men came forward claiming that they had seen three Wampanoag warriors kill Sassaman and throw him into the pond, the English decided to show Medicom who was really in charge of Massachusetts. English soldiers arrested the warriors and brought them to Plymouth. The Wampanoag warriors were tried, convicted of murder, and executed. Medicom was furious. How dare the English invade his village and drag away his warriors? Three days after the execution, Medicom and his men attacked a little Plymouth settlement, burning houses and driving the settlers away. War had begun. The war between the English and the Wampanoag dragged on for months. The colonists had more guns, but the Native Americans were better at surprise attacks and ambushes. And Medicom convinced other Native American tribes nearby to join with him in his war against the English. Native American warriors burned English settlements, killed English colonists, and took others captive, only releasing them in exchange for money and weapons. One of these captured women, Mary Rowlands, Rowlandson, wrote about the attack on her house. It was the dolefulest day that ever mine eyes saw, she lamented. From all places, the Indians shot against the house so that the bullets seemed to fly like hail. Some in our house were fighting for their lives, others wallowing in their blood the house on fire over our heads. Then I took my children to go forth and leave the house. But as soon as we came to the door and to the door and appeared, the Indians shot so thick that the bullets rattled against the house as if one had taken a handful of stones and threw them. Mary and her children were captured and held prisoner for weeks until her husband paid money for their release. After eight months of war, 1,300 Englishmen from Plymouth banded together to make the strongest attack yet against Medicom's forces. Medicom and his warriors had joined together with another tribe, the Narragansett, and were camped out in the middle of a treacherous swamp. The Englishmen sloshed through the swamp and attacked Medicom's camp. The battle, which became known as the Great Swamp Fight, almost wiped out the Native American warriors. Medicom himself fled west into the colony of New York and tried to convince the Mohawk tribe to give him fresh warriors and weapons. When the Mohawks refused, Medicom tried to keep up fighting with his remaining men. But his shrinking army, I mean, I'm sorry, but his shrinking war band could not resist forever. Eight months after the Great Swamp Fight, English soldiers surrounded Medicom's camp. Medicom escaped, but his wife and nine-year-old son were captured and sold as slaves to South America. Medicom evaded the English for ten more days, but was surrounded in the middle of a swamp, unable to get away. A Native American warrior who had joined the English forces shot Medicom. The English then cut off his head, 
paraded back to Plymouth in triumph and put Medicom's head up on a pole in the middle of the settlement, where it remained for years. Because the English called Medicom King Philip, this war became known as King Philip's War. Twelve English towns had been burned to the ground. One out of every sixteen men had died. Crops had been destroyed and farms leveled. In the following winters, many colonists died from starvation. But more than 3,000 Native Americans had died as well. Whole villages had been burned. Entire tribes had been killed. The few remaining members of the, those tribes scattered, many fleeing to the north. Now the English could continue to spread across North America, across, across land empty, left empty, I'm sorry, left empty by King Philip's War. This is the end of part one of chapter 15. We'll read part two next time. Okay, see you then.